Good evening. My name is Jerry Cochran, and I'd like to call the City of Pasco Planning Commission meeting to order. I'd like to welcome all those in attendance, either in person or online, and I'd invite you to join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Uh, to begin night's meeting, I would like to ask the clerk to do roll call. Tanya Bowers. Joseph Campos. Present. Paul Mendez. Present. Kim Lerman. Present. Abel Campos. Present. Isaac Myram. Present. Rachel Teal, Jay Handler, Jerry Cochran. Present. Mr. Chair, we have six members present and we do have a quorum. Thank you. The Planning Commission is an advisory board made up of volunteers appointed by the City Council. The purpose of the Planning Commission is to provide recommendations to the City Council regarding changes to the City's comprehensive plan, land use updates, block grant allocations, and zoning code. The Planning Commission is tasked with considering the long-term growth and development of the community, the impact of land use decisions on the community, livability, economic opportunity, housing affordability, public services, and the environment. I'd like to remind the audience that tonight's proceedings are being broadcast live on the City of Pasco's Facebook page and on Charter Spectrum Cable Channel uh, 191 and will be rebroadcast several times during the next month. Uh, this meeting is also being recorded so you can watch it on the City of Pasco's website which is pasco-wa.gov. Click on the video and on demand link and make your selection of the meeting there. There are copies of the meeting agenda available online on the City of Pasco website, so you may follow along with the meeting. At this time, I'd like to ask the audience also to mute your microphones and cell phones to prevent interruptions during our meeting. For those present this evening, when you're given the opportunity to address the commission, please raise your hand, uh, either virtually or in person, so that you'll, we will know that you would like to address the commission. Speak clearly into the microphone and state your name and city of address for our records. Uh, before we begin the meeting tonight, I need to remind the audience and the Planning Commission members that Washington State law requires public meetings like this one being held this evening, not only to be fair, but to appear to be fair. In addition to Washington State law prohibits Planning Commission members from participating in discussions or decisions in which the member may have a direct interest or may be either benefited or harmed by the Planning Commission's decisions. An objection to any Planning Commission member hearing any matter on tonight's agenda needs to be aired at this time or it will be waived. First of all, are there any Planning Commission members who have a declaration at this time regarding any item on the agenda? Let the record show that none declared. Second, is there anyone in the audience, either in person or online, this evening who would object to any Planning Commission member hearing any of the items on the agenda? Let the record show also that none declared. So we as the Planning Commission members, we value your input. It helps us to understand the issues more clearly and make better recommendations to City Council. Furthermore, in many cases, your input here at this Planning Commission meeting is the only opportunity to get your facts and opinions placed on the official record of the City Council uh, that we'll use to make its decision. I encourage you to take full advantage of the opportunity. Beginning our agenda, the next item is the approval of the meeting minutes from the last meeting, which is the uh, September 16th, 2021 meeting. Uh, these meeting minutes were mailed out to all the commission members ahead of time. I trust you had the opportunity to take a look at them. 
Um, if there are no uh, issues, discussions, or objections, I would entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes. Uh, this is Commissioner Jay Campos. I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes as read. Thank you. Second. It was moved by Commissioner Jay Campos and seconded by Commissioner Lerman. Sorry, who? Oh, Commissioner Lerman. Uh, I moved, uh, let's see. Um, all those in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Any opposed? So let the record show that the meeting minutes were unanimous, unanimously approved. Uh, the next item on the uh, agenda is unfinished or old business. We have a number of items that have previously come in for the command commission and they are here before us on the agenda tonight. Is there any items? It looks like we have no old business or unfinished business. After that, the item on the agenda is a series of public hearings. The first item on the public and only item on the public hearing agenda is corner lot fencing. Um, I don't have a record number, but it's just corner lot fencing, so I'll turn it over to staff. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. <clears throat> I am here again to discuss corner lot fencing. Um, I will briefly touch on the presentation and the current options, um, as well as a new option that I will be presenting tonight. Uh, so this is PMC 25180501C. Uh, effectively, what this says is that when you have two corner lots and they form the entire frontage between two parallel and nearly parallel streets, and neither dwelling uh, accesses the shared street. Uh, fences are allowed to extend out into the, front, uh, the flanking front yard at a height uh, not to exceed six feet. When one of those two dwellings accesses that side street, uh, fences are limited to three and a half feet. And so to give a visual representation of this, this is the um, situation where neither house accesses the shared street so six foot fences are allowed um, in every zone shown here, except for the blue area. Um, the next slide will show uh, what this looks like in practice. You can tell that neither house accesses the shared street. So the fences are allowed to extend out to what is presumed to be the property line at a height of six feet. The other situation is where one of the houses uh, accesses the side street. In this case, that's the house on the right. Um, in this case, the six foot fencing is required to be set back to the building line of the house that accesses uh, the flanking or shared street. Um, in practice, uh, here's an example. Um, the house on the corner, uh, since the house on the corner's fence is required to set back, uh, be set back to the building line of the dwelling behind it because they don't form um, that parallel, uh, the shared frontage between two parallel streets. And going back to the first option, I, I apologize. Um, uh, no, uh, moving forward to the, to the first option. Uh, this would be no restrictions in the flanking front yards. So this would remove the provision that um, fences are um, in the flanking front yard can only be three and a half feet when one of the houses accesses the shared street. So um, six foot fencing would be allowed in all areas but the blue, no matter the situation. Um, to give an example of what this looks like, this is a property on Cathedral Drive. Uh, looking at the image on the left, you can tell that that house accesses the shared street. And between the side of that house and the fence is a very small gap of um, space. And driving down the street, um, you can really not see what's um, in that, that driveway. So if you're a car driving down the street or you're a pedestrian walking on the sidewalk, um, the driver of a car reversing out of that driveway isn't going to see you until they've already crossed the, uh, that sidewalk, um, which can be a hazardous situation. And moving forward, um, this is another option. It's um, 
a requirement that the fences, six foot fencing, uh, be set back to the building line of the dwelling when one of the houses accesses the side of the street. Um, and this would make it so that your fencing requirements are no longer based on your neighbor's um, building line and um, gives more independence to the lot. And our new option, um, and this kind of helps to resolve the issue that we saw um, with the property on Cathedral Drive. Um, this would be an addressing consideration. So when dwellings come in for permitting, um, it, it would give uh, the reviewers the ability to determine that the house must face um, the non-shared street side. Um, similar to the cathedral situation here, the, the two properties on the corner, um, they, they were per, uh, platted under two separate plats meaning that when the northern house was built, uh, the house to the south was a vacant lot. Um, so they, in essence, would be allowed to build that six foot fence out there to the, to the property line on the shared street. And then the house to the south could be built after the fence. And because we wouldn't have the ability to say, oh, no, you can't face the house this way because, the, because of the fencing there, um, we can created a situation where that driveway is going to be very close to a fence um, that blocks visibility. Um, additionally to this, um, we would allow fences, or we would have the requirement that fences, when a house faces uh, the, the flanking side street, um, be set back a distance equal to the dwellings required setback. So an R1, R2, R3, R4, RS1, that would be 20 feet. And then an RS-12 and RS-20, that would be 25 feet. And with that, that would conclude my presentation. And, and Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to add that, um, so what, in essence, what this would mean is that during the platting review, there would be uh, extra care given to reviewing the shape and the configuration of lots with the, with in, in these situations on corner lots. And then during the permitting review of homes for those lots, we would probably need to establish a code provision that um, required, um, I, I don't know how it would be worded right now, but that would uh, require that the addressing or the home face a certain direction. Um, <clears throat> so it's a little more involved than uh, just interpreting the code when you're on the fly and trying to permit a home. Uh, but um, I, I, I do think it's important that um, if we use this option, I think it probably affords the most logical way to provide some kind of solution. Uh, we would necessarily need to um, describe it and note it in our municipal code. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it looks like we, in addition to the two previous options we had discussed last month, you came up with two more. One was the, this one you just talked about, and then the other option, obviously, is to do nothing, right? So, um, <laughs> um, and it seems like the drivers are primarily, on one hand, safety and visibility, uh, and on the other hand, homeowners that want to have the freedom to, to build fences without feeling like there's city overreach or whatever, right? So I think those are the kind of the two sides of the spectrum. So it seems like you, staff, I appreciate, I know we all appreciate you um, looking at all the different options and kind of going back and continuing to look for a good balance between the, the um, discipline we need to put on this without also balancing property rights and what pr property owners want to do with their property. So with that, um, do commissioners have any questions or comments or feedback? I think what we're looking for tonight from commission members primarily is staffs looking for feedback or questions on the different options and uh, what direction uh, the commissioners would like staff to go on this and then we will continue this in another public hearing and uh, make probably recommendations at a later time but right now it's just feedback and questions I, I believe right Any commissioners with questions or comments? Um, this is Commissioner Jay Campo. So just as I'm going through this, I'm kind of glad that this is maybe maybe coming up. Um, 
as a Pasco citizen my whole life, I spent most of my time driving these streets, uh, basically since I got my driver's license. I noticed this is an issue a lot with um, not just fencing, but also like shrubbery and, and, and growth like that. And so I don't know, I don't see anything. I mean, this is specifically for fencing, but if we're convinced or talking about safety issues and uh, stuff like that, it might be worthwhile to not just look at the language for fencing, but, but just anything that might obscure or obstruct vision, um, you know, in the pathway. But also, instead of looking at maybe fencing, I didn't see anything on here specifically, but, but maybe require where a you know, driveway can be located. If there was an extra two feet between that driveway off of um, the slide beforehand and the fence, you know, it might, might give enough field of vision for somebody who's walking or pedestrian to be able to be seen a little bit better as opposed to, you know, restricting someone's right to have a fence all the way up to their property. Thank you, Commissioner Campos. I think that's in option three. I think that's what uh, Mr. Mator mentioned when, or Mr. Roy mentioned, when the permitting for the new house in the new platted area, it would just be which direction does the house face and where would the driveway end up would help mitigate some of that. So I think that's already built in to option three. Am I correct? But it's a good, great point on the shrubbery and stuff. That, that's correct. Yeah, that, that would be correct. Okay. Um, I would add um, shrubbery does fall within to the same classification of this code. So um, it would be wrapped up um, at the, the top of this section. It does describe that it applies to any shrubs that form that screen or any form of fencing. Thank you. Uh, other commissioners? Questions? This is Commissioner Lehrman. Go ahead. Um, I'm looking at option three and I'm recalling a situation that we had um, up on Desert Plateau about 18 years ago. And at the time when we built our house, the builder said we can be able to rotate our house to which street we wanted to face. Um, later on, it led to a problem with fencing. And so um, thinking of back about how the, the steps that were taken or the steps that weren't taken, um, which created quite a hassle for us for um, one, getting approved for the fence to be built, the height of the fence, and then two, ask later on to have it removed. Um, and then going through that whole process of uh, communicating with the city. Looking at this, I would like to see option three for the fact that we shouldn't have homeowners in limbo it should be decided upon ahead of time and then um, well communicated out. And so I like that um, Mr. White was talking about um, updating code provisions to be able to add language in um, for about how to codify the situation. So um, we just really don't want any homeowners in that situation in the future where um, the, the fencing was built with a permit and then later on um, asked for it to be removed because of a safety um, situation. And as well as we don't wanna have um, citizens in a situation where um, fences are being built and it's unsafe for pedestrians and also for drivers. Thank you, Commissioner Lerman. Great comments, appreciate that. Other feedback or questions from the commissioners? Okay, hearing none, um, I think we will, this is a public hearing, so um, we will go ahead and uh, open it up for public uh, comments. So if you are here to comment on this form item, please come up to the podium, uh, come forward. Please state your name and city of address uh, for the record. Thank you for being here. Yes, um, I am six feet apart. Is it okay if I take off my mask? <laughs> Okay. Hi, my name is Maria Teresa Valdez. I'm a resident here in uh, the city of Pasco. Um, I did come specifically for this meeting. Um, I understand that option three gives the permitting aspect for the builders and to kind of be checked. I love that. I think that's needed. But we also have to remember about the residents that have been here for years. Their, their fence requirements 
don't add up to the new regulations. So I think with knowing that, we need to decide also what that's going to entail. So when code enforcement goes around and says, hey, that's not supposed to be there. When are those fees going to be implemented? Things like that. I feel like as a community, we need to put that first because then that's what's going to cause a lot of confusion. Um, I also would like to say when someone purchases a property and has their house on there, their intent is to use it as their home. If your neighbor then decides how the diagram here, the house on the corner, where the, where the fence was six feet on both sides, because the home was not there originally, and that, what does the city plan on doing to relieve that situation? Like, are you gonna make the homeowner who built the fence 10 years before the home was built incur that cost? Things like that. Um, my other option um, on here, that was, as long as it's three feet from your fence, from your property line, are they still able to have that six foot fence? That's another question. Because if it's all the way out to the street, I understand six feet kind of, you know, it would disrupt the view. But if you're only back three feet from your property line, are you still able to have that six foot fence? And that's the way the I read the code is now, correct? Rick White, I don't know. You're more about the codes, you know a little bit more. Well, I if I understand your question, um, fences, uh, generally go to the back of the sidewalk. Um, although the back of the sidewalk is normally not the property line. It's uh, usually a few feet in, as you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe we do not, we do not permit fences in the right of way any longer. That's correct. We look yeah. past the fence and we use the ADA right Yeah, so uh, as of the last few years, they've been set back a bit, a couple of feet perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, particularly on the residential lots with 60 feet of right away. Um, and then your other concern about the, the any fence legally installed now, no, no matter what happens in the future with code regulations, is going to be uh, what's called grandfathered in. Okay. So they'll be, uh, if it was done legally and it meets the code now or then, it will be fine that way. Right. Okay. I do appreciate that comment because that was my main concern. I'm like, I have all these houses. We have those nice center block fences put up and to take that down, that cost would incur. That would be insane. Um, my only thing is if there are already provisions to set that back, how you say the three to six feet, why would we have to go back in and rewrite the code? I guess that's my, because if it's already ha at that hip, if you're trying to build a fence line, it can't be on the property line, has to be set back three feet. If your homes are not forward facing the same direction, why would this be? Well, go ahead, Andrew. That, yeah. That's an actual different question than what I understood. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually when one of the, the houses uh, accesses that side street, it's not set back, um, you know, three feet or so. It's actually set back to the building line of your neighbor's property. Um, generally speaking, that's going to be 20 feet or more. Um, and so what we're uh, looking to do is try to explore options on how to either leave it alone or be uh, more considerate of how that can impact the homeowner. Um, and so the, the situation where a fence would be allowed at the property line, um, that distance that's about three feet or so, is when neither house accesses the side street. Okay. Uh, I hope, does that answer your question? It does, it does. Um, but I'm talking about in that situation where we have here, where one home is facing one direction, one's the mm -hmm. other, would that provision, how we said that three feet, wouldn't that still eliminate what's going on here now if we implemented that to the corner lots as well? As long as your fence is pushed back three feet from your property line, that's plus the sidewalk, plus the extra um, space in the road for bikers and things like that, wouldn't that be more than enough space? Uh, generally, no, especially when the when the driveways are that close to those those fences, m most people are going to be reversing out of the driveway, and there's a considerable amount of um, visibility that you would you would need to have to make sure that when you're leaving, you're not um, backing into oncoming traffic or um, somebody running by, for example. I understand what you're saying. Uh -huh. I just see it as a more practical. So, like this house here, 
um, if you want to go back to it, the picture. You're saying how his his fence reaches all the way out here, right? It makes his driveway. This is what you're talking about, that that's six feet? This right here. So with this property line, this is a corner lot. Here's his driveway. His fence reaches out here. If this house was forward facing, obviously, on the same side. Are you talking about this right here? Or which one are you talking about? Because that's where I'm just kind of confused okay. because for well, the same reason, I understand the driveway is probably more than that 12 feet or what have you. But yeah, you and ma'am, I'll, I'll go. We can't yeah. catch your comments on the oh. for the other count, uh, commission members, but let me go back to a, a yeah. different slide. Because um, I just see it as a homeowner. I want to be able to utilize my property and have that privacy with homes being built so close to each other. Can you imagine? the next guy with all their kids running around and things like that, that three feet fence or what have you, you're looking straight through everybody's windows. And I feel like that's a concern that most people are gonna have. I don't have that, my home is old, it's built, it's grandfathered in, I don't have that issue. But I also wanna be considerate of everyone else. You know, when they buy their property, you don't wanna be having to see your, your neighbors through their bedroom window and have kids and it's just a hassle. So I'm sorry if I'm kind of going back and forth, but it's just those things that I'm like, I don't want my kids looking through your window and if a six foot fence can prevent that, why not? But um, thank you again. I know Rick, you said you're gonna go back to that slide, but that's my main concern here that I kind of want to bring up because homes are just so close. And if that fence was just pushed back three feet, I mean, I feel like that's more than enough space especially in a residential when no one should be driving above speed limit or anything like that. So thank you for your time, guys. Thank you. Yes, it's a difficult issue. It's trying to balance between that visibility and safety issue and that property rights issue. It seems like, um, I think with option three, it does provide an option for the city to take that on a case-by-case -case basis, it seems, as they're looking at those new homes. And of course, they're, the people with existing fences are grandfathered, but I think it seems like the existing code does create in limited situations potential safety issues and that's what we're attempting i think to mitigate so is that accurate characterization yeah that'd be accurate okay. um are there any commission members that had questions for the applicant i be sorry you sat down but if i want to make sure if somebody had a question for you they could ask okay are there any more questions or comments from the commissioners on this issue. All right, hearing none, I think um, this is a continued issue, so we'll mm -hmm. see this next month again. And uh, mm -hmm. whether it uh, is a motion or a continuing again, we'll see um, where we're at on this, but it sounds like you've gotten some feedback from mm -hmm. both citizens and the commissioners, and we can see where we land next month. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that concludes um, our public hearing portion of the agenda. Um, there's no more public hearing items. Um, we have also no workshop items, but we do have in the other business category, we do have a memo on the utility extension of the UGA. So I'll turn that over to staff for um, discussion. Again, this is not a hearing or action item. It's more for the commission's uh, information, I understand. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item is a lot different than the one you just considered. Um, this involves utility extensions in the urban growth area, and uh, it uh, stems, of course, on a number, well, a whole history of growth in, in the city of Pasco, but particularly uh, relative to the 2021 Comprehensive Plan Adoption. Uh, as the Commission knows, we expanded the urban growth area considerably. Uh, 3,600 acres, rough, roughly. Um, that urban expansion is being appealed right now to the Washington State Growth Hearing Board, but this issue about the policy for utility st extensions still needs to be addressed because it's going to be important moving forward. Um, and I hope the commission has had the opportunity to read the uh, staff report on this. Uh, I won't go into uh, a rehash of that, but uh, the major points of the staff report um, focus on the uh, really inefficient use of public funds in particular to maintain and develop inefficient infrastructure when unplanned growth occurs. Uh, it's, it's definitely easier for unplanned growth to occur. It's less expensive. 
but in the long run, it costs everybody in terms of direct financial costs and future considerations for loss of land, loss of street connectivity, and a number of inefficient municipal services. Um, City Council and the Planning Commission have stressed a number of issues with the comprehensive plan process for the last two years. Uh, of course, the, the goals to encourage urban development in urban areas where adequate facilities and services can exist or be provided is an important goal the Commission and Council recognized. And the goal of reducing the inappropriate conversion of undeveloped land into low, sprawling, inefficient, low-density development was recognized as a critical goal towards that end. In Pasco here, we're, we're faced with um, three fairly unique situations in terms of our urban boundaries. Uh, in the unincorporated or, or at least recently incorporated Riverview area, uh, we have a, an odd mix of um, low density development, some of it even without city water, but certainly a lot of it with septic systems. Uh, it's uh, noted to be lacking in adequate right-of-way. Uh, often structures, homes, uh, garages, etc., cetera, uh, are directly in line with what would be considered logical road extensions, and it's very difficult to retrofit those areas with urban services. And we're noticing that more and more every single day when people ask to subdivide their property. Uh, the second situation is uh, lands that are uh, generally outside the Riverview area, but were not included in the most recent urban boundary expansion. And I'd uh, just bring the commission's attention to uh, that those properties, let's say Northwest of Burns and Broadmoor Boulevard, uh, those are in our old, I'm gonna call it the old urban boundaries. Uh, many of them use city water, um, but uh, Generally speaking, those properties are mostly filled up with uh, half-acre developments. Uh, they use septic systems. They do have city water. Uh, if they did not have city water, they'd probably be one and one half acre lots because that's the minimum that you need to have a, uh, a well. And I can't remember what the exemption level is with state water law, but uh, generally it'd be between one and a third and one and a half acre lots. And then the next situation we have is our new urban boundaries, and those are uh, clean slate opportunities. Uh, they, they, there are no roads, there are no constraints aside lack of utilities, and they offer the best chance for achieving some of the goals that Council and the Commission have focused on in the comprehensive plan process. So um, what uh, we've proposed in terms of um, the staff perspective is a separate treatment of those three areas. Um, the unincorporated Riverview area, or uh, also including at least the recently incorporated Riverview area south of 182, um, will be provided city potable water when asked in conjunction with building permits for single family homes on existing lots. That's uh, a fair proposition. <clears throat> it prevents any kind of, uh, quote, taking of property, and it allows uh, owners of existing lots to utilize their property, uh, presumably with what they intended it when they bought it, which is a single-family home. Any subdivision, however, of parcels in the unincorporated and incorporated Riverview area would require extension of city sanitary sewer in, con in conjunction with extension of city potable water. And then there's a caveat with that that uh, indicates we would uh, strive to develop a procedure for exceptions when it simply is impractical and uh, we would rely on some kind of an engineering analysis to come to that conclusion. For those lands uh, outside Riverview that were within the old urban boundaries, uh, again, the uh, extension of city potable water with uh, building permits for existing single-family homes would be uh, at least recommended. And then, uh, just like in the previous example, uh, the subdivision of existing parcels within that old area 
would require uh, extension of city sewer. And I might add for the commission that um, <clears throat> there are not many properties left in the old 2008 urban boundaries that are in this uh, situation. And then for the newer properties, uh, however our appeal plans out, plays out, um, we would simply require annexation for extension of city services. And this, of course, would uh, by default result in uh, conformance with the city's development standards, uh, impact fees, and any other development regulations that would apply um, to uh, properties already in the city limits. So um, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a big issue. It's, it's, it has a lot of ramifications. Um, staff attempted to address just the essentials in this memo. Uh, uh, we would certainly welcome commission discussion. And uh, once uh, some feedback is received, uh, we are currently working with our uh, legal team to come up with a series of uh, municipal code amendments that would be needed to uh, be addressed through ordinances. Um, and hopefully, depending on what uh, we hear tonight, um, we can come back with something for the commission in November that uh, narrows this down a little and, and fleshes it out. Great, thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, yeah, I know, I mean, this is a, in general, it's, you want um, new homes to leverage the investments the taxpayers may have made already, and when they don't, you want the developers and homeowners to bear that burden um, because uh, the city has made those investments and the taxpayers have made that investment. So um, I, I think it seems like a reasonable approach. I don't know all the details on this, but um, one of the questions, um, when you say, uh, when you say the, 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 what was the wording you used here? Ex the require an extension of city sanitary and city water. Um, I assume that means that that's on the developer or homeowner's property owner's dime, or is that on the city's dime? Yeah, it, it would be on the, uh, either the owner or the permittee applicant. Yeah, good, okay. So I think that, you know, again, you know, from my feedback perspective, I think that, you know, putting the burden on the developers and property owners to bear the burden when they aren't leveraging the investments the city has already made is a, is a, a reasonable rule. Um, but I will open it up to the other commission members for comments and feedback. I think the staff would love your input and guidance. So please feel free to chime in. Any comments from other commissioners? So I, I have a question. This is Commissioner Lerman. Go ahead, so Commissioner Lerman. How would that work if there was um, maybe within the old uh, UGA, there's four neighbors um, in a row and one, um, one plot of land uh, doesn't have a home on it yet. And for that permit to be built, or for a home to be built there, they would take on the burden of sewer and water alone? Or um, how, how does that work? Um, so there's four lots in a row, let's say. Uh, three of the lots have homes on them, and the last lot. Uh, does not, and if they come in for a building permit on that existing lot, they would need to extend city water themselves. If they came and approached staff with a subdivision of that last parcel, then they would be expected to extend um, not just the water to serve the, the new subdivision, but also the sanitary sewer. And that's All because right. a lot becomes too small for a septic. In uh, well, in, in theory, um, but, but again, um, this goes back to the, the premise that within the urban boundaries, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be using septic systems. Uh, on existing lots, it's, it's different because they're there and, and people generally, I think it, it, 
I think we agree that they have a property right to develop their home as on, on an existing lot. Um, in those limited circumstances, there's probably not going to be much argument about use of a septic system providing it meets the health department regulations. Uh, but if you subdivide those properties into additional lots, then I think within the urban area you would be expected anywhere to provide sewer. Thank you. Any other Thank questions you. or comments from commissioners? All right. I don't hear any. Uh, or do you see any? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, that was the last item on our meeting tonight. If, are there any other comments or questions from the commissioners? Yeah, I, uh, this is Jay Hindler. Um, I have one uh, just in general. Somebody can help me. Um, when when is a project or an issue required to come before the planning commission? Just just out of curiosity, um, I'm, I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the procedures there. Can somebody fill me in? Sure, I can, uh, Commissioner Hendler. Um, when we switched to the hearing examiner, I guess it's been about two and a half years ago now or so, um, the, uh, the quasi-judicial items, the special permits, the preliminary plats, and the rezones uh, moved from the commission's, planning commission's workload to the hearing examiner workload. Um, so uh, those property-specific items, I think, that you may be thinking of um, are now in front of the hearing examiner as opposed to the planning commission. The planning commission, and I'm sure all the commissioners remember, uh, was intricately involved with the comprehensive plan process. Uh, we've entertained a number of code amendments in the past year in particular. Um, so with major planning efforts like the comprehensive plan, um, uh, code amendment process, the transportation system master plan, the commission received several updates on, uh, you'll be involved with those. Uh, and then there are some administrative processes that don't go to the examiner or the planning commission. And, and one of those is short plats. And uh, for example, the, the example that Commissioner Lehrman just brought up, uh, that would typically be a short plat and uh, a, a subdivision into less than nine lots. And that would be handled at the uh, staff level as it has been forever, essentially. Do does that help, Commissioner Hendler? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you, Mr. White. Um, yeah, so so not every project is going to be seen by the planning commission. Um, it's unless they fall within those parameters that you just uh, out, outlined, is my understanding. Yes, and and they'll there'll actually be a few more coming this your way this year, but or uh, probably early next year now. But um, that's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Well. Well. Thank you for that clarification. I. I would. I. I would. I didn't understand. So. 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 so thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Handler. There's probably that's a great question for all of us to be clear on. So thank you for asking. Are there any other questions or comments from the commissioners? And Mr. Chairman, I. I. I I'm sorry to interrupt. I did want to point out that. Um, this item uh, will <laughs> is one that will be coming back to the commission this year. Uh, if we can get the ordinances uh, tied up that affect the existing sections of the municipal code, uh, we'll be able to advertise for a public hearing, and you'll have a much better idea on, I think, the practicality of of the items discussed in the in the staff report. Awesome, thank you. So we'll see this in the form of a more formal. Uh, public hearing item in November or December. Okay, thank you. All right, one last call. Any other questions or feedback from the commissioners? I, I do. This is Commissioner Lerman. Go ahead. 
Um, talking to residents, many um, talk about um, how formal these these meetings are and how um, it's a little bit hard for them to to follow or to interact. And um, thinking about um, Commissioner um, Pendler's uh, question, I'm wondering if there's an infographic that could be put up to share with both commissioners and also the public of um, the process that uh, the city uses um, from the hearing examiner on out to when things go to the commissioners um, to be able to help communicate out, um, like I said, these these formal meetings that we have here and how citizens can be involved in and follow along a little easier. Great question, Commissioner Lerman. Uh, is there already something like that exists on the website or? No, there really isn't. Um, I, um, yeah, I think we could take a stab at something like that. Like a simple flow chart or block mm -hmm. diagram or something might mm -hmm. be really helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that input. Thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, hearing no further questions or comments, I recommend, uh, I don't know that I need a motion to adjourn because we're in uh, other business. So I uh, will adjourn the meeting at uh, 7.16 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you.